There's no secret. There's no shortcut. Everything that is alive is conscious. Be silent. Be still and know God. Until you feel worthy, it ain't going to happen. Rigorous, ruthless, disciplined focus. You have to get to a place where you can work on yourself. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, this is part three of the amazing podcast with Laura Knight. Yad chick. Notice how I pronounced it correctly for the th- for the third time. One out of three is not bad. And of course, my good friend Hunter Williams is here. Um, so we're just going to jump right into the topics. Um, the first two episodes were quite profound. And now here we are in part three. And obviously, we're asking a lot of questions as it relates to her book series, The Wave, and then some of her other books, um, which she has many um, from Paul. To, uh, from Paul to Mark, uh, Paleo Christianity, of course, um, the other one, High Strangeness. So a lot of different books that she's written and we're c- covering those. So I think today to start, we want to talk about reality creation because obviously the new age has really mucked it up, right? I mean, they've, you know, I, I mean, I know from like the great Neville Goddard, all of his books, you know, the statement is, you know, live as if the wish is fulfilled. And there are obviously many other new age authors and, um, you know, great writers who have talked about, you know, that your thoughts create and control your reality, but you are probably the first person, at least in the writings that Hunter and I have encountered that really said, well, there's some truth to it, but there's also some issues about it that you must understand. And, you know, maybe you could go into that a little bit deeper than this, say the average new age metaphysician does. Oh boy. Okay. First off. <laughs> Set you up perfect. Yeah. I mean, like, like you just said, the guy you just quoted, you know, live as though it, you know, you're whatever it is you want is exists. And there's, there's been, I don't know how many books about, you know, positive affirmations and right you know, living your dream and so on and so forth. And the unfortunate thing is, is that with very rare exceptions, it doesn't work. Now, let me give you a a kind of a sideways example here. Um, My, my former mother-in-law, she's now deceased, um, was a a great follower of the evangelist, Jimmy Swigert. I don't know if we're familiar with Jimmy Swigert, but he's quite a character. Jerry Falwell, part two. Yeah, and she uh, she would get him on the television, and he'd say, you know, come up and put your hand on the screen and pray with me, and you're going to get a healing. Right. Well, she had a bum. Real. She had a bum knee, and she did this one one day when she was watching the television, and she swore that her knee was completely healed. Well, oh. not very long afterwards, I, th- I think she her knee was healed for maybe two years, and then. Jimmy Swagger got involved in a scandalous uh, sex sex escapade and was exposed as being, you know, not quite the the righteous guy he pretended to be. And all of a sudden, she lost her healing. (laughs) 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 Completely. And, you know, that's that's kind of an example of what some people can with with the power of their mind, you know, uh, establish and maintain some kind of a change in their life, you know, as long as it's related to belief. But as a general rule, those people are rare. Usually, well, I shouldn't say they're rare. Uh, they're hypnotizable, mm-hmm. like that are easily hypnotized. And if you've ever worked with hypnosis, then you know that, you know, generally when you have an audience and and you're using hypnosis, you test your audience to give them some commands and so forth. And you you keep an eye on them to see who who is best at following the command and and who isn't. And then you don't pick on the one who isn't for your demonstration because you know it's not going to go well. So, I mean, that's kind of like hypnosis 101. So there are people for whom uh reality can be changed fairly quickly because they you know have this belief and it supports it uh people who have 
big problems, serious problems. And those are, unfortunately, the people who really buy those kinds of books because they really have serious problems. They may have, you know, poverty, they have um, uh, illness, they have relationship problems, they have, you know, a lot of serious problems. And they think that they're going to get themselves into a, a, you know, a whole new life just by believing it to be so. Mm -hmm. And at a certain point in time, I was very much involved with the New Age com community in the Tampa area. And I had a lot of friends who were very much involved in it. And I had a lot of friends who were talking about this book, that book, the other, trying this, trying that. And, you know, I watched, I observed, I listened, you know, and I didn't see anybody's reality changing. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, in my book, Secret History, I wrote about the uh, reality changing problem and there's a there's a book God, i forgot the name of it uh but in the event it was about you know changing reality with the power of your mind and they had some experienced heavy duty meditators they got in there and they were really working and what they managed to do at the end of this long process was to change the ph of a very small sample of water Mm -hmm. And that was all they were actually able to do. So, I mean, we we don't necessarily use those kinds of experiences as our guidance. But here's another problem with creating your own reality. Say you want to create your own reality. You want to change something about your reality. The problem is what part of you wants to do this and what part of you doesn't. Right. You are not you know, a, uh, a unified individual, if you haven't been crystallized on a solid foundation, you know, one part of you is going to want it and cry and scream and carry on and, oh, I need it, I want it, I got to have it, and, and, and then it's not going to happen, and then you're going to just be kicking yourself in the behind because you're going to be saying, well, you know, there's something wrong with me, I can't even create my, you know, da-da-da. And so that's another problem. Okay, you first, so first of all, you have to have some unification and that only comes by self-work. Yeah. I mean, if you really seriously want to change your reality, okay? The other thing is, is you have to have knowledge. I mean, you can't just, mm -hmm. you, you can't just tell the universe, you know, what you want and expect to get it. Because what if, what if what you think you want is completely counter to the plans of, say, your higher self? Mm -hmm. You violate the free will of someone else. You know, you're going to get into a lot of problem there. So, well, we came up, and maybe it's easier to explain this by explaining the method that we use. Um, my daughters and I kind of came up with this plan or this method. And it was, it came about because back when I was in a lot of physical therapy, I had to go to this therapeutic gym three times a week. And I would get on the, the treadmill now. I can't walk like walking down the street because I have a back injury that prevents it. But I can walk on a treadmill because I have handles to hold on to. And I yeah. sure gives me back support. So I would get on this treadmill and I would close my eyes and walk. Walk with my eyes closed. I know that is that sounds counterintuitive, but I did. And I would start visualizing things. <clears throat> and I began to notice that things began to happen. And I realized that what was necessary was the generation of the energy that came about through the physical walking. You know, because you're generating electricity if you're walking. And but it was all it was not done in like a, a directed way. It was more like in a, a floating uh, daydreaming kind of way. Okay. So there was there came a time when uh, we needed something and we needed something very specific. And I'll, and I'll tell you, it was a house. We needed a house, a very specific house to to house all of us here. Sure. And my daughter says, "Well, mom, why don't you why don't you try that thing?" And I said, "All right." I said, I'll, I'll try it. And I said, you guys have to help me out. So we set the, the treadmill up uh, and we put this big giant crystal in a bowl of water there on the floor in front of the treadmill. And uh, we got on the treadmill. And the thing was, was I know from my experience as a hypnotherapist 
what not to do when you're making suggestions. Because you don't make directed suggestions to somebody that limit their options. You know, you don't lead them. If somebody needs to be happy, then what you do is you have them see themselves as happy. You don't right. tell them how they're going to be happy. You don't tell them how they're going to get there because the universe does that. And if you don't let the universe does it, do it, and you're going to be, you know, kind of going against the universe. So we got on this treadmill and we just saw our, we visualized ourselves congratulating each other for finding the perfect house. That's it. That was the extent of the visualization. And we, you know, would put that, that visualization into that crystal. That was just kind of like an added thing. I'm not going to guarantee anything about the crystal. You may not even need it, but that was kind of like a yeah. thing for me. Because as far as I could see, you know, once you stopped the treadmill, you know, the, con the crystal can continue generating the thought while you're doing something else. So we were all doing that. And I'm, it must have been, oh, I don't know. 10 days to two weeks mm -hmm. and we found the perfect house. And I mean, it was perfect and the situation was perfect that we were able to acquire it. I mean, like within, within two weeks we were moving in. So, you know, that, that's a whole other thing, but that little example is what I mean by when you want to create or change your own reality, you can't decide what it is specifically that you want or need what i mean because if you do and if if you're you know say it's a million dollars i want a million dollars and say your higher self i.e universe or whatever has it in mind that you have a, you know a karmic debt to pay or you need to learn a lesson or you are there uh, suffering your your situation because somebody else is supposed to interact with you at some point in the not too distant future to you know take you out of that situation. You know any number of possibilities exist for why you are there, in addition to just you know the ordinary situation. And so the thing is is to find the most general thing that you can think of which is, you know, being happy. I mean, you can sometimes get a little more specific about things. You can, uh, like, for example, you know, a house. Mm -hmm. But in that, you, you don't even specify the house. You don't specify where it is, you know, anything about it. It's just that you see you and the people involved being happy and congratulating that you've had success. That's, that's it. You make it as general as you can because... Whenever you anticipate something, and this is something that C's kind of made pretty clear, when you anticipate, you block right. the possibility of something manifesting in your life. To, to that point, I want to say in my earlier life, because I've always been, and I think most people do this, you know, especially directed driven people, but it was always had to be a specific way. And it was like bullet points, bullet points, bullet points, bullet points. And so once I realized that it was more about as what you've just discussed, the conscious awareness that I see it, I don't know how it's going to happen, but I know it's going to happen. I'm going to keep working. I'm going to do my inner work. I'm going to meditate. I'm going to do all these things. And at some point I'm going to create that reality, but it's not going to be specific. That has been a dramatic revelation for me in my life in just the last like six to seven to eight years because as soon as I gave up and let go of the the finite things that had to happen, it started to happen a lot more. And so I, I 100% agree with you. I, I mean, I've seen this in my own conscious life that it really does come down to just having an idea that if I work towards it, and again, I work on myself, these things can happen, but they're not going to happen as exactly the way that I anticipate them being. Well, there's also got to be, there's another factor that's involved. I mean, in addition to, Doing your your soft visualizing, which is you know general, and you know I add the energy to it, you know by walking on the treadmill, or you could do a bicycle if you wanted to, or mm -hmm. pump iron, I don't know, whatever. Um, 
there also has to be active input on your part in the physical realm. You have to keep your eyes open. You have to be putting signals out there to the universe, you know, that, you're, you know, you're open to something. I mean, if we weren't looking on a real estate website, we would never have found it, right? <laughs> so, you know, I mean, you can't just sit there and wait for somebody to come to your door and knock on it and say, here, I have a house for you. I mean, that's not going to happen. you got to physically do something right. to get it. Now, the interesting thing about this is, is that um, it's, it's part of the whole philosophical underpinning of what the seas have talked about. You know, the, in a sense, we are all one, but mm -hmm. not, not in the easy way people like to think. You know, I mean, it's not like it's, there, are, there are laws, there are rules, and there are levels of being, and you can't assume the position of God when you're not anywhere near that level and you have no nowhere near that much knowledge you know that's that's something you don't want to do because all that's going to do is bring you know heartache and grief into your life so about creating your own reality just think of all the people who read the books and it says all you got to do is take these little affirmations up around your mirror all day or you you know say it over and over again and it'll happen and they tell these wonderful stories about how somebody was just was doing that and then they got on the bus and somebody came up to them on the bus and gave them what they needed or gave them the whatever they needed. And so they make it sound like it's totally easy. And people, unfortunately, believe it that way. Yeah. And then that's the way they go about it. And the only person who's changing their reality is the person who's writing the book and making money. You know, the thing is, is they actually did do something. They wrote a book and they got it published and put it out there to change their reality to can make more money. And, but they don't impart that part of the formula, you know, to the, to the, to the reader who is just left with, well, I, you know, I've got to visualize and I've got to recite my mantras and I've got to do my affirmations and so on and so forth. I mean, like Louise, hey, I keep this little book here in my desk drawer. Yeah, I refer my wife has the app. You know, they eliminated the app. We literally live that. We we have the same thing, Laura. We live we live by that book. It's amazing. It's literally an amazing book. The thing is, is, is well, she's got affirmations in there, and and the affirmations are very useful because they help you identify what your problem might be. That's right. We have to do more than just repeat the affirmations to get a handle on it. You know, you have to do some work, you have to do some research, you have to do, you have to find out what your belief center is. And, and in the esoteric tradition, the belief center is is like, like there's two bodies, you're side by side and, and each one has three centers and they're represented by a circle. So imagine two boxes side by side with three circles in them. The one is the intellectual center, the emotional center, and then the moving center or the sexual center or the physical center, whatever, however you want to describe that one. Right. And the idea through working on yourself is to be able to merge yourself with these higher centers. And the first way that that happens is by the connection between the emotional centers, your lower emotional center and your higher emotional center. And when you're in certain states, you know, you can induct the energy of that higher emotional center into your uh, lower emotional center. And you can have energy that then can run things as long as you don't let it run amok. And all of these things are very, very, uh, they're understood. And they're sometimes rather precise. I mean, it's like... Uh, it's like some guy who wanted to learn a particular breathing technique, you know, a yogic breathing technique. And he, he kept begging this yogi to, you know, to teach it to him and teach it. And he says, no, I can't teach it to it. I can't teach it to you because, you know, it'll work and it'll burn you up. <laughs> See, and those are the, these things have to be handled in a proper progression because if you increase the level of your being, Without increasing the level of your knowledge, you become imbalanced. Right. Well, you become a, a being that's able to do certain things, but you're not smart enough to know what to do, where to do, when to do. You know, so you know, it, it, I mean, I've given you probably as much as as I can give you that's simple, simplified, and might actually work for people 
without getting into them getting into a, a real long process of working on the self. I mean, if you want bigger and better things, you want to change your reality. Changing your reality, I should also say, is generally chaotic. Right. I mean, if you really want your reality changed, generally you're going to have to do something very hard and very difficult. Chaos is going to ensue. And things are going to be unsettled until they settle down into the new reality. That is merely the physical manifestation of an esoteric thing happening in your life. Because mm -hmm. you don't just get a flash of light and, and wake up in a new reality. It can't happen. It's extremely rare, vanishingly rare. But in the normal course of events, if you want to change your reality from one to another, you have to make a decision. You do this. Okay. And then you have, at that point, you have branching options. Okay. Which one are you going to go for? You know, you have to make the next decision. So then you've picked this option. These other two options fade away. Okay. And then you're on this step. More options appear. And each time, and then you eventually find yourself over here where you want to be. And you started here. You know, here at the beginning, at, but you haven't just, you know, flipped. You have taken step by step by step by step. Mm -hmm. there. It's, it's, uh, yeah, we do, we do, uh, to a great extent, control our reality. And our thoughts are very much involved because your thoughts are involved in making those choices, making those decisions that take you step by step to that new reality. But uh, it's not just, it's not just dreaming and transfer complete. Oops. Sorry. I was going to say, what was that? I have a, a system where people send me files and, and I, oh, very cool. I just received a file. That's all. Or I did, I did want to ask you with this, cause I think you had mentioned this some in your book from a, I guess it'd be more of like a physical level. Do you think the creating of a lack? So if you are saying like, Hey, I'm poor and I want to be rich and you put this being rich on a pedestal, it reinforces your current state because you're separate from that. And does that perpetuate even more? So someone that's, do you think that someone that's focusing on something that they're not all the time, it actually reinforces their current state more than it brings them forth to the state that they think they want to be in? Sure, because that's that's one of the principles of, of like hypnotherapy. I mean, you keep telling somebody, you know, you will be or you da da da. That just that's all that's the subconscious mind is absolutely literal. When you say right. you will be, then the subconscious mind says, I'm not now. Right. That's exactly right. Right. You know? And then I, what I'm not now is, is and also, is, you know, once again, it's involved with choices. And very often these choices are emotion-driven choices. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you allow uh, limiting emotions to drive your choices, you know, you'll, you'll end up uh, wherever. That's why conscious word languaging is such an important thing for people that are truly, you know, attempting to manifest and grow. I mean, obviously it's the inner work, but I mean, you think about people who constantly use the words could, should, would, try, yeah. I hope. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and you can analyze language and, and listen to people. And uh, uh, I don't think I was ever much of a could, would, should. I've always, I was like you though. I was pretty OCD for a long time. I had to control yeah. everything. And while I was controlling everything, everything was out of control. <laughs> exactly. Especially my emotions or you're, I'm sure you were the same way, you know, because yeah. you're just like, yeah. And as soon as I, as soon as I exerted control over my emotions, that was actually the first step. Right. Exerted control over my emotions. And I said, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do this logical thing here instead. It was hard. Yeah. You know, yeah. And I mean, that was, that was the first step of my changing my reality was, it was not, uh, giving into emotional choices. 
but being logical. And, and I, I had a, a friend who was with me at the time and she, she said to me, she says, make your list, read it every day. Because when you start feeling emotional and want to go back to where you were, because it was familiar, it was comfortable, you know, you know, you knew it. She says, read your list Why you're doing it. So do you, do you, do you think, I mean, this is an honest question. And, 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 and by the way, I think it was in book two where you were talking about PMS. Yeah. And that's a very profound, uh, you know, anecdotal story about women who, who have to experience this and okay. how they have to make a conscious choice to realize that they can either become emotional about it every single month of their life and let it literally, like you say, control their life, control their reality, or to be logical about it and say, okay, these are hormonal experiences that all women or female cre you know, creations have to experience. And so you can choose your reality around it. But my, my question around this is, is it harder for women to actually be logical because of that? I think it could be so. Yeah, it could definitely because, I mean, men, I don't think can even understand. Well, some men can understand because they live, they live with a woman or they, they, they can't get inside it, but they, right. and, and if they have compassion, you know, they, uh, I mean, like I said, you know, my husband always tracked my periods on a, on a, an Excel database. He knew what was going on. Right. And he knew to be really, really sweet to me. <laughs> Part of the Right. So but I mean, I think to what you're saying, though, to that, you know, all joking aside, it does take a very strong, powerful, empowered woman to choose to be logical yeah. at the time that they're supposed to be emotional or driven to be emotional. Oh, yeah. And well, the, the reason I used the example was is that the that women understand emotional uh mess ups in their lives because they know that well last week i had my period of law i was a basket case i was crying and everything he said to me you know was setting me off and so you know now i realize what an idiot i was you know women have that insight because of that experience and men also have hormonal emotional sure. uh, situations, maybe not the same way or the same type or the same extent, but because they don't have this exaggerated example every month for all of their reproductive years, they never think about it. They never mm -hmm. stop and think, you know, well, I am reacting emotionally because, um, let's face it, I mean, testosterone can make you react very emotionally. For sure. And, uh, it can make you make very poor decisions and you have to be able to control that. So, I mean, men need, I mean, I am not one of those who believe in toxic masculinity. I think, you know, men should be men and women should be women, you know, because that's, that's what they are. And, but they, and they should know each other's weaknesses and strengths. I mean, yeah. so it's, um, it's an example an exaggerated yeah. caricature, but men can understand that they have emotions too that they need to watch for and to control for and to master. Right. Yeah. And, and I think that really, I mean, this is a very profound conversation around just what we're talking about right now, but I think it really is like the great control lever for individuals when you can take ownership and be fully accountable for everything that happens to you from a standpoint of like how you respond or how you react. And obviously emotionality is normal reaction or reactivity, but choosing to respond out of love or choosing to respond consciously from a, from a standpoint of awareness is the great move, mover and shaker, I think, for humanity. And I think a lot of souls, you know, bodies, it takes a long time to actually get to that point where you don't fly off the handle or move around or change or freak out. You know what I mean? And it's, it's a conscious choice. I mean, it, it absolutely is a conscious choice to get to that place. But I mean, a lot of people, Laura struggle with that. 
Well, it's not just flying off the handle. Sometimes just minor irritation can right can ca can cause a lot of problems. I, I'll never forget. I was reading this book, Heading Toward Omega, and it was some study about near death experiences and what and people who'd had these near death experiences and what they saw during them and and sharing their stories. And this one guy, you know, went to a bad place. And he felt really, really bad. And then all of this, this stuff, like a movie, you know, ran before his eyes. And he saw what was making him feel bad was because he was, he was, he was a jerk. And he was always, you know, being nasty to people in a casual way, uh, and and hurting, hurting their feelings. And that th these were the things that were piling up against him rather than any big decision he ever made in his life. It was all the small hurts that he inflicted on mm -hmm. him. Very often, even people he didn't know, you know, just like being nasty to a, to a, a server in a restaurant was one of the things, you know, but the, the dynamic between him and his wife or whatever, you know, didn't weigh so heavily because that was something that was more involved. It was his casual cruelty that, uh, the counted the most. So, you know, being irritated, being irritable. And I've always, I've always thought about that, you know, since I read it, I said, you know, whenever you meet somebody, you know, try to be nice, go mm -hmm. a mile. Well, what's, what's actually amazing about that is, um, you guys had your session recently, which Hunter and I read yesterday and literally I'm reading this from the session. The dancing, pa dancing past the dark, distressing near-death experiences by Nancy Evans Bush. What influences the variability of near-death experiences? And in particular, why do some people have disturbing experiences? And the answer from the seas was, no matter where you go, there you are. How <laughs> profound is that? I don't know if it's pro profound, but it's accurate, I think. So, yeah, no matter where you go, there you are. Yeah. Well, that's a that's a good question. I just thought of too, Laura. I don't know if the C's have talked about this, but near death experiences is that actual death that that person is experiencing that we're all going to experience, or is that some sort of like in between state that only those people experience that we won't when our physical vessel expires? I think that yeah, the C's said something about it. We were talking about it on a couple of occasions. Some people sleep. It you know it depends on your condition at death. Depends on your beliefs. Depends a lot, and and the C's once said that if you have no expectations, you have a purer experience. Right. So you know, and and I I often talk about the I did a hypnotherapy session with a person who had a who had a hip problem, and we did a it was during the time that I was experimenting with spirit release, and I didn't tell the person, you know, what I was going to do, but I went ahead and I started asking the sequence of questions and come to find out that there was, he had an attachment that, you know, resonated with this injury, uh, this old injury on his hip. And it was, uh, you know, so I, I started to have a conversation with the, with the, with the entity, right? And we can reserve judgment about, you know, any kind of whether this is true, whether it's manufactured by the person's brain to explain their problems, you know, you know, just set that aside. I had the conversation and the entity said it was female and that she was afraid to go into the light because that was my objective was to get her to, you know, depart and leave my client alone. And why are you afraid of the light? You know, because I'm a sinner. So on. and she had died during a rape she'd been raped well wow. you felt that because she had died in a state of sin that is having you know having sex because of course sex was very sinful that she was damned and had to you know hide from the light and, and hover around and you know that sort of thing and i had to you know go through into some kind of like theological discussion with the entity to explain to him that that's not the way things work and so forth you know finally get her off into the light but that's the kind of thing you encounter. People um, get beliefs about what they are going to experience or expect when they pass out of their body, and they might get exactly that. You know, I mean, if they if they think that they are 
damned, you know, no matter what, they're going to have a bad experience. And then they end up being, you know, attracted to some poor, poor guy walking by who's got some kind of frequency vibration going on in his hip that kind of is a, a match and they just, you know, glom on and that's it. So, yeah. <clears throat> Which even thus furthers a p the point of you create your reality. If that's the belief set, like the belief center that you're carrying around, it's not only in this life that it echoes through into, I guess, I don't know if the astral realm would be the right word, but it does like, I guess, reverberate across densities. Yeah. I mean, all minds are connected in some way. Mm -hmm. Not quite, you know, and I'm working on a, on a series of articles right now that I'm going to, I'm going to explain all of that. Uh, I'm posting on my husband's website because he asked me to write about some stuff, you know, it keeps his readers occupied while he's working on his math. So, uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm working on that. There is definitely uh, a way that we are all connected and I would like to pin it down and, and fairly exact terms so that, you know, it can be explained easily to people. And maybe by doing that, then we'll have a better idea how to work with it. You know, I mean, you don't know how to work with something if you don't know what it is. Cool. To that point, and this is a random, although you did ask Hunter this question off of that as how we are all connected as one. So Hunter recently with me did the toad, which is the, five m five meo but the desert the snoring desert toad while we were in mexico we did a ceremony on the beach with a quote-unquote shaman and we you know inhaled it through a bong or whatever but i've done it a number of times in my life it was his first experience but it does for whatever it does it puts you in the zone of consciousness where you feel like you're connected to everything and i know that there are some people that have done it and they get a bad experience but like I don't recall, you know, and obviously I'm not as familiar with some the C sessions as, as, you know, some of the other people that are in your audience and stuff like that. But did, what, what are the C's thought processes on plant medicine and theogens is what they're really called. You know, what, 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 what is happening when um, you use those substances? Have they ever called, talked about that? Yes. You're not going to like it. It's all bad. Well, they call it a, vi a self violation. That if you induce something like that with a an external chemical, yeah, uh, that means that you're not producing it inside your own body from natural processes that you can initiate, and then there it, it becomes a self violation, and it, it it can impede your progress, but not necessarily. I mean, I wouldn't get all tied up in knots about it and and the thing was was it came up in a discussion of melatonin because the seeds you know encourage the use of melatonin yeah and there are a lot of reasons to use it and they pointed out that the distinction was that melatonin is manufactured by the body mm -hmm. and the thing is is that when you're using things that are not manufactured by the body it's kind of like the same problem you get with say adenosine um you know it it uh, attaches to your to your receptors uh, or caffeine attaches to the adenosine receptors right. and blocks the adenosine but then the caffeine doesn't have the full characteristics of the adenosine so you get an artificial you know awakefulness because it's preventing right. the adenosine from binding and you don't get the, the full benefit so we would imagine that uh, plant chemicals or you know things that are from outside the body can do the same thing at, at the same time there are plants that are healing because they you know they interfere or they or they bind or they block you know other things but in terms of changing your consciousness when you start messing around with your brain and the consciousness connection then you can you can cause problems yeah it, it, it's interesting because i've never done anything else other than 5-MeO and every time that I've done it, it's been very healing, very cathartic. And I don't do it to seek out like any sort of high or feeling from it. It's just, I've done it to actually show other people. And 
Um, it seems like, you know, the new age, if that's part of the new age community, now it's become like commoditized and people are using like ayahuasca ceremonies and peyote and ibogaine and all these different things. And I always kind of joke and say, well, 5-MeO is like the one thing that puts you into the source field faster than anything else. And you don't purge and vomit and deal with all these other different things and, you know, have shadow work and all this other stuff that goes on. But um, I, I can see why they would say that because you are... You're, it's it, it's a, however you want to look at it, it's an artificial you know uh creation rather than something that you could do from meditation uh or really deep spiritual you know processes of inner work you know whether it was fasting for 30 days or you know there's 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 other ways to do it so i mean i i, I would understand why they would say that i would i would be interested though in their actual if you guys could ever ask them a question about the the toad and, and and why that is like why is it that that thing produces what it produces i'll have to um look into it because i don't know anything about it uh, yeah. they have mentioned that the use of uh, uh psilocybin is that it yeah psilocybin mushrooms uh for depression can be beneficial you know it can, mm -hmm. but not any prolonged use but you know like a, a kind of a therapeutic dose mm -hmm. and yeah uh, yeah so it, hang on here and i'll well does but doesn't it in, in relation to that doesn't it get back to the conversation or the state the statement that the difference between a pill and a poison is the dosage so whether or not someone's using something you know pharmaceutically all the time versus recreationally to overcome depression or overcome some form of trauma or something like that yeah yeah and sometimes people are depressed simply because they're chemically imbalanced and in those cases right. you know another chemical can you know give them a, a you know physiological kick in the seat of the pants to get them over on the yeah. other side of the line and uh and sometimes people get stuck in places yeah. and i mean it's like the same thing with like pain you know you get stuck in pain and you just keep saying, oh, I'm not going to take anything. I'm not going to take anything. I'm not going to take anything. But then taking something would be the best thing you could do because it would break that cycle. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I read something the other day where they said people taking pain relievers, you know, it's supposed to be bad for them because it uh, reinforces the pain. And I, and I don't believe that at all. You know, I don't, uh, I don't think that's true. Well, Hunter, you could talk a little bit about your experience or whatever if you want, but I mean, it's, there's another point that we could just relate to it, or, or that I think is a perfect offshoot of this, and this, this is the statement, and I'm pretty sure this is from the last book, but it's also from book one, but uh, there's no such thing, explain the statement, there's no such thing as source, because as the Cassiopeians have said, we are prime creator, so I mean, I mean, this is... This is, it's not far out there, but obviously, you know, for people that are a quote unquote of a spiritual nature and believe in God and source creator or whatever, not this, not the, you know, the Abrahamic religious teachings of God, the external judging God in the sky, but, but just as some form of source consciousness or creation force, if there is that thing, like, how does that, how do you, how do we relate that statement to that topic? Well, because we are all of it. I mean, if, uh, Philip Goff. No, it's not Philip Goff. It's Bernardo Castro, philosopher, has had an interesting uh, way of explaining it that I read recently, and I, I, I had to laugh when I read it. But he uh, he used the example of people with multiple personality disorder or dissociative identity disorder is what it's really known as. Right. As an example of how we are part of all you know because and he used examples of how these you know personalities uh in a person with did they would be you know totally uh, discreet and individual and in one case uh, one of the personalities was blind uh and you know they tested them while that personality was in control and they really were blind and then uh, as soon as the other personality that was sighted came back into control then the brain areas that uh were involved with sight lit up again. Uh, the one that was, um, there were one that was diabetic. One personality was diabetic. The other personalities were not, and the body would fully manifest all of the, all of the, uh, conditions that were tested through blood samples for being <laughs> diabetic. 
But when the non-diabetic personality came back into control, the, you know, all of that went away. So he was saying, you know, just imagine, you know, all it is, and then it has an initial split, and then more splits and splits and then multiple, you know, I mean, right down to the point where each and every one of us, our consciousness is a part of, you know, is one of the personalities, but we're, but just like with DID, we are individual and distinct and unique, but we are still part of the same, uh, you know, basic person. So I think that's kind of like a fun way to look at it. And I think it's probably as close to the truth as we're going to get. I mean, I think that there's the one at seventh density, then at sixth density, there's like, you know, multiple splits that are into like idea centers. Mm -hmm. And some, of you know, half of those are procreative and the other half are uh, anti-creative. And then they, you know, they kind of come down like the little diagram you know, that we were looking at. It's, uh, it's very, very simplistic, but imagine it multiplied, you know, a bazillion times for each individual. Um, so, you know, the cities have said that the human race, I mean, we were asking questions about Lucifer. Right. And they said, you know, that's you. You're the, the human race has fallen. You, know, you are Lucifer. Right. That means a, a, uh, a large inclusive being that splits into millions, if not billions of individual, you know, uh, identities. And that's, that's another part of it, but we're at the stage where we are like split off from, from one being. And, and I'm sure that there are different individual groups of people on you know, in the universe or on earth or whatever, that are parts of other mm -hmm. great beings, you know, uh, Ra called them social identity complexes. And that's kind of like as, as good a term as any. And when people kind of get together and, and if, especially if they get together with the people who are members of their specific social identity complex, you know, one would imagine that they can do some very interesting things. You know, we, we do some experiments with that sort of thing in some of our meetings. And, um, you know, like I'll get a hundred people and put them under hypnosis and we go into a hyperdimensional state and start doing visualizations and making experiments with looking at things and doing things. And it, it's, it's, uh, it's very interesting, you know, so... So would we be to, to that, to that point, would we be a social identity complex, meaning advanced, awakened, aware souls, you know, in third density right now? Um, I think we're working towards it. We're still in the realm of confusion, all of us. Right. And we're still working on overcoming that confusion and, you know, to become you know, I, I don't even think you'd go into that state immediately upon uh, elevation to fourth density. I think that that's something that comes over time. Uh, and then and then at that point, maybe you move on to become like a, a fifth or sixth density soul. So, yeah, I think I think we're just working on trying to get our average above 51 percent. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> If we can be 51% good, but the, the good thing about being on the positive pathway is that, you know, if you are involved with a group, you know, all of the achievements of the group are part of your achievements, you know, because right. of the connection with them. So you don't have to be so perfect that, you know, you, uh, you know, that you can no longer live in this world. On the other hand, on the negative side, you have to be really, really, really negative to graduate negatively. I mean, that's where I was just going to go. That's where I was literally just going to go. So this is this is segwaying so perfect. So I, I wrote this down. I'm just going to read it to you and then I want you to respond. What is the realm border crossing just for people that don't know what it is? I mean, again, this audience, by the time they get to hear where we're at now, I think it's going to understand. But you could say and then to what you just said, how do third density services self beings? 
is the right is is the word ascend the right word in the fourth density service to self, which is really a nasty place, versus service to self. I'm sorry, versus service to others, third density service to others, ascending into fourth density as a service to others candidate. So it's it it it, it seems to me that's where you you were just about to talk about it, but I wanted to set it up for the audience. Well, I'd say that we're candidates here. Right. Right. Candidates. Right. If we actually, you know, because of a, a network or because of some really fluky, weird, vanishingly rare, exceptional goodness and purity, which almost doesn't exist, yeah, <clears throat> managed to make it to fourth density, <clears throat> then we begin to interact in our kind of like, it's almost like a separate universe from the, from the SDS forces, you know? Uh, not precisely, but it's a separate segment of the universe, and they, uh, and then they begin to become more, ref more and more refined, and they continue to do work interacting with third density, and as I understand it, that they reincarnate uh, into fourth density. That it, you know, it's a para, it's semi physical. What is the thesis? Semi physical, para physical. Yeah, yeah realm so that you know it's not strictly 100 percent physical and i it's not like it's not like uh fifth density you know, where people go and they you know they go through like a daily life i mean i've heard people describe uh, um uh, their life on the in the afterlife well you know we live on a farm you know there are fields and flowers you know et cetera, et cetera, and how wonderful it all is you know uh I don't think it's like that. I think it's, I think we are actually in the process of experiencing some of these changes here and now, at least some people are. I mean, I know that I live in a reality that is so different from what the rest of the world live in, that there is not even any, any comparison. I mean, I look out at it and I, I in the same way that you can be third density and interact with second density, you know, animals, right. plants, and so forth. But you know, you don't per, you don't partake of their perceptions any longer. I mean, you can imagine them and you can describe them and you can analyze them and so forth, but you don't. You are not there any longer. And fourth density, I think, is you know orders of magnitude greater than the third density. Than the third density is to second density. But still, we are experiencing, we are seeing, you know, these things happening. We are seeing, we are in, we are in the middle of the wave. Right. And remember when I said, you know, changing realities is chaotic? Well, that's what we're in the middle of. We're in the middle of yeah. the chaos that will bring about a new reality. And let's face it, um, macrocosmic changes have historically been chaotic and violent. Right. And I think it's part of the economy of the universe that a lot of people will die. And a lot of people will die because they are not ready. They're not, yeah. yeah. Well, that, well that, that's a question though around that then. So do the less aware people go before the more aware people do? Not necessarily, no. Sometimes more aware people go because you know they they already know this one and they don't need to they don't need to learn it. <clears throat> so you can't make a judgment like that because every situation is is absolutely you know individual. Mm -hmm. I think that in the in the situations of extreme violence, where you know mobs are involved or people are involved in things that are reprehensible, et cetera. I think that, yeah, we can say that the less aware, <clears throat> I mean, the seas have even talked about soul smashing, that some people's souls will be smashed and they will be returned to primordial matter. Um, it's, it's variable and there's all kinds of things going on. It's not, you know, maybe someday it's, the best way to know is to read all the sessions 
We can right. pick up a little bit here, a little bit there, because you know we're never intelligent enough to, to get a project to cover it. And the seas, the, the seas are so demanding about us doing our own work. Right. I mean, they they make us, you know, do our own work and think about things and work on things. And I mean, you know, it's uh, it's not one of those interactions where you become weak and ignorant because you're just relying on on a source to give you all the answers. No, you got to go out there and dig for it. But no, we are in the middle of the wave. And there are people who are going to be soul smashed because things are going to happen that are going to be violent and chaotic. Yeah. And then at the same time, the Caesar said, you know, what a glorious way to go to fourth density. <laughs> I mean, right. So, so, well, so do, do you think then, and I don't mean to cut you off because this is amazing, but do you think then that your vibratory frequency, again, they call it your frequency, the FRV, the frequency resonance vibration determines on whether or not you experience extreme violence, you know, polarized shifts in both physical and etheric reality, or yeah. it just is random? Well, I think it's your FRV, you know, because the C's have talked about, you know, not only, not only is it, not only are you a transmitter, you're a receiver. Right. And I mean, they've said, you know, receivership capability determines, you know, how you will transition. And uh, receivership capability depends on a lot of things, including a clean body. You know, uh, you know, I, um, and by that I mean clean of chemicals and all that sort of right. thing. And uh, that's part of it. Also, your your mental processes, your thinking, your emotional processes, um, how crystallized you are as an individual. Are you the same individual at all times, in all cases, with all people? Most people are not. Right. So, <clears throat> So that's that's the one thing that's the one thing that I can say that I am I am authentic, transparent, and no filter with everyone. <laughs> well, being authentic and transparent isn't necessarily the criteria. It's it's being. I understand. Yeah, it's it's a little bit more complicated than that, but that's getting close. Yeah. No. No. I mean, I just say that because, like, I don't care. Right. Like, you know, I've lost a lot of family members, friends, you know, people in my circle because I'm like, it is what it is, you know? I mean, and that's, it's, you know, it's it, it, not to, not to rabbit hole off this. Cause I think this is really deep. Um, and Hunter, please, you know, expound on this, but like, it's really hard reading your book. Cause I'm almost finished now with Paul DeMarc. And when you know the truth, the truth shall set you free, but you cannot converse with people who are so steeped in the nonsense slash, you know, whatever you want to call it, you know, the ideology of, you know, Abrahamic religious teachings who cannot at all accept a divergent viewpoint. Well, let me ask you, Hunter, you read it all the way through. Do you think you'd be able to sit down and talk religion to somebody? <laughs> it's funny. I was actually telling Jay this. I did this past week with two friends who I would say more or less are like probably Christians in the traditional sense. Um, and I brought this up to them. And the funny thing is I always, I'm like, guys, you don't read books. You read the Bible over and over again, but you don't read books to like elucidate your understanding of the Bible. But I said, I, I introduced a lot of the concepts to them from Paul to Mark and they're, response was there's too much conflicting evidence that someone named Jesus of Nazareth yeah. walked the earth because of all the other things that I'd said. And what I told them is you're looking at one set of evidence that was co-opted to create a narrative around that, that then ended up being like you talked about last time, this meme that people create into their head that then becomes reality. And what they go back to, I think, when I look at people like that, because I know people in my family like this and friends, it ultimately stems back to fear because if they have to acknowledge, like if they sat down and would actually read Paul tomorrow, if they had to acknowledge 
the data that comes from that book and the conclusions you draw from it, it would shake the foundations of their understanding of what everything that they've been told. And a lot of people are afraid to shake those understandings because it would mean they'd have to look at other areas of their life and how they carry on other areas of their life and do a thorough examination. I think people, for whatever reason, don't want to do that. And I think also, too, they're attached to the fear of the next life, kind of like we were talking about earlier. They're attached to the fear of that. And if they do something that they think in the next life will set them up to go to the lake of fire or hell, whatever it is, they don't want to do anything here to preclude them from that. So to me, it's like, I, I guess I would understand in the sense of I want, I'm open, like I'm not attached to any sort of information I'll come across my whole life that could change the course of my life. Because like you said, it could change the course of my life for the better. And they're attached to the information they receive, having to have a certain conclusion and outcome that keeps them from not straying too far from that because it would shake their foundation. So I think it's, they hear it, but they go back to these like, uh, like install, like software installation that they got at a young age or whatever age. And they're afraid that if they lose that, that their salvation is predicated upon them, like acknowledging it. So, so Laura, before you say anything, cause this is so, so incredibly insanely profound. My dad in our family, no, just for feedback, my dad and my family are very left brain, very rudite, very educated you know, academic people. So he puts in the day yesterday, beware today, the Ides of March, the day they nailed Julius Caesar. And I wrote, you mean Jesus Christ? <laughs> <laughs> now check this out. Now, this is where it went from them. And my brother was like, what are you talking about? Huh? And I said, everything you've ever learned or really just told about Jesus is BS. And then my dad says, who is Jesus then? And I said, and then somebody else in my family said, uh, Yeshua. And then somebody said, is that the Jewish name for Jesus? And then this is what my brother, Joey, who's a very academic family member said, and I want to read this to you. He says, no question, modern Christian. Oh, cause I, I said, I'm sorry. I left out dad. You might really like this book. And then I gave him the Amazon link to your book. And then he said, my brother, Joey said, no, no question. Modern Christianity was engineered in many ways. We don't know much about who wrote the Gospels, nor how the works of the New Testament and St. Paul evolved or were sourced, but we know Jesus was real, and we know he stated unambiguously he was the Son of God, which invites the old C.S. Lewis line, he was either a liar, a lunatic, or the Lord. Oh, my. Yeah. <laughs> well, I will just point out, and I think, you, I think you're aware of this, what I undertook to do with this book was to do a serious historical study using strict historical methods, which yes. nobody in biblical research really does. I mean, right. mainstream biblical research. And important in historical research is chronology. What mm. came first? What came next? What came next? And then if you follow it, you see the progression. You see how it all happened. You know, the earliest thing first, and then the next thing, then the next thing. And you have to use <clears throat> all kinds of, of tools, you know, to kind of tease that out. But once you do that and you see the progression, then you see that, well, that's, that's obviously how it happened because it couldn't happen any other way. So, um, yeah, so these uh, these people that talk about you know all the multiple witnesses like you know Bart Ehrman you know calling the four Gospels for independent witnesses, and yet when you do analysis of the text, you see that Mark was first, Matthew was second, Luke was third, John was you know not even in the race, but <clears throat> and and you see how they how they used Mark. And then you also understand that Paul was first before any of the Gospels. So once you understand, and if the Bible was even arranged as it ought to be chronologically, I mean the New Testament, you would see that. But the, well, that that's the other thing too, is most Christians 
are so far gone. They don't even understand that Paul's writings were well before any of the gospels were even pieced together. But then you go one level deeper in your book where you actually, to, to me, your book was like this big bulletin board. You ever see like in the crime shows where they have the bulletin board and there's like pinpoints with like tic tac or uh, tacks and they've got the strings and going everything. It was like DNA that because you have, trace. you have, yeah, you have Josephus, then you have Pontius Pilate, then you have Paul, then you have the gospel writings and everything. And what you did through like connecting all those strings and everything, was you showed the timelines are completely invalidated from what people think actually happened. So by default, you couldn't have this guy named Pontius Pilate and this guy named Jesus of Nazareth that did this thing. And then Paul had his you know, revelation and everything on the timeline that it was supposed to have happened. So even if you took everything else out of the equation and you just had that, you would say, okay, well, this is invalidated because of this. And then you could take it another level deeper and you have uh, Judas the Galilean, uh, this person that was doing this and was going on at this time. So, um, but it's just tough because I think, I don't know if it goes back to fear that people fear for their next life, you know, because I've, I've just seen so many people, um, you know, rest in peace to my grandmother, but she was, uh, I think through her life, she died last year. She was like a very strong Christian, but she wasn't always that way. Like she grew up, you know, in a Christian household. And I think she would say like her faith took hold like later in life, but she always would say it's fire insurance to me because she was more scared of going to hell than she was excited to go to heaven. My mom and, was the same way, Hunter, as you know. My yeah. mom died of COVID last year, Laura. She was 77, 78. She really died of being uh, inflamed, obese, insulin resistant, you know, all those things. And of course, they labeled it COVID so that the hospital could get paid. But my sister literally told me, because she was with her at death, and I was in Mexico at the time, um, still living there, but uh, that she was, she was afraid of going to hell. She literally was well, afraid of I mean, going to hell. There's a, there's a lot of the fear of hell industry, you know, out there. Right. I mean, that's, it's an industry because that's how you get followers and that's how you get believers and so on and so forth. So, but yeah, but anyhow, let me stop you for one second. I, I, I was pulling up here on my other screen, uh, this thing about hallucinogens. Perfect. And let me read it to you real quick. Cause it's short. Now, I, my question was, I was talking to the C's. I want, you to know that you have lost a fan because he was not happy with what he considered to be internal con inconsistencies in that <clears throat> you were not favorably disposed toward hallucinations produced by substances such as mescaline and ayahuasca, but yet you recommend melatonin because it is a hallucinogen. Then you said that spiritual powers could not be obtained through chemicals or plant type means but then said that melatonin exercises psychic abilities. Could you comment on this? And here's their answer. Several comments. First of all, fan is short for fanatic. <laughs> <coughs> Gotta love them. Secondly, melatonin does not force an alteration in physiological brain chemicals, as do mescaline, peyote, LSD, etc. Accessing the higher levels of psychical awareness through such processes is harmful to the balance levels of the prime chakra. This is because it alters the natural rhythms of psychic development by causing reliance on the part of the subject, thus subjugating the learning process. It is a form of self-imposed abridging of free will. Melatonin simply allows the system to clear obstructions in the brain chemistry naturally, thereby <clears throat> allowing the subject to continue to learn at a natural pace. And it is by no means unimportant that melatonin is a natural body hormone. The other substances mentioned are, at least in part, synthetic, with the exception of peyote. But even that is not a natural ingredient of the human physiological being. And besides, we have already discussed the importance or lack thereof of those who pass judgment upon this exercise or communication. <laughs> so you definitely, you definitely have to ask him about 5-MeO because it's of the toad. But yeah, I mean, it, the, the point still still stands. Um, wow. I mean, I mean, to me, well, to it's get so, an answer like that. Laura, is like, that's, that's really interesting. In the last couple of years and some of the work we've done in the health space, um, first of all, fluoride calcifies the pineal gland, which suppresses melatonin production. 
and right. impairs melatonin production from the pineal gland. But also, too, we've come across uh, work from researchers and doctors Doris that actually, yeah, yeah, that will mega dose melatonin in order to help immune system function. Okay. But in, yeah, but in doing so, it enhances like psychic function and enhances the dream state because you know, we're probably not experiencing the same melatonin levels that, you know, our grandfathers and their grandfathers had because of the oxidative stress that goes on with the pineal gland that suppresses that. And so that's why there's certain peptides that help with melatonin production. Taking melatonin itself is so important. So well, are you familiar with the work of Doris La? I'm sure Gabby is. Doris who? Doris La. She's a Chinese researcher. She's like the world's second or third most uh, researched melatonin researcher. She's actually a friend of mine. I've done a bunch of, she won't do any podcast with anybody on the planet except me. It's pretty amazing. But I actually never met her in person. She was living in Mexico when we first connected in COVID during 2020, but she saved literally millions of people because she was the person that first came out and said uh, melatonin at high dosage would help people because at the very beginning of COVID, when they thought that it was about, um, you know, they needed to intubate people to clear, uh, you know, breathing pathways. And then they found out that intubation was death. That it was because obviously COVID or whatever COVID was, was robbing oxygen, um, you know, in the cells. And so she was like, well, high dose melatonin is a very powerful redox molecule. And so it will help. But anyway, long story short, she, she has a bunch of people in her universe ecosystem that take three grams of melatonin before they go to bed. And they talk about now they're also talking about now, as Hunter was just saying, there's a bioregulator called pineolon that obviously uh, strengthens the pineal gland and actually helps to uh, eliminate the retardation of the pineal gland from calcification from, you know, all the sludge in the environment. But um, it's very interesting these people that talk about taking these dosages because they say they can actually leave their body. Their sleep is incredible. I mean, there's just, there's all sorts of stuff. I mean, it, you know, I, I can send you more information about Doris, but, um, but she's a, she's a really, really good person, well, at least in my experience working with her. And, 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 and uh, it's interesting that they would talk about melatonin, the C's meaning in that way. Hi, oh, hold on one second. Hi, yeah. would you turn that light on over there? I had to turn this one off over, over my eyes because it was showering me. Yeah, that's better. Now I'm alive. There you go. It was the one better. up here was just really going around my eyes. Blue light, baby. Yeah. So, yeah, they are, they've always, I mean, there are a number of references. I think there's um, probably, uh, I don't remember. There are. Well, there are 30 references to melatonin in the sessions that I have up to date. But that one was the most interesting. And uh, and we've tried. I, <clears throat> I didn't like the high-dose melatonin myself. I mean, it may have done something beneficial for me. I don't know. Did it for a while, but, you know, I was entirely too sleepy, even during the day, you know, kind of kind of groggy or, you know, halfway halfway hallucinating <laughs> well how much did you take do you remember how much you took oh lord we we went up there um and were you just putting it under your tongue just like that the powder underneath your tongue no we were we had the powder and we had pills and we were using combinations you know so you could get something that was immediately active and then something that would then you know kick in later on and uh uh well to be quite frank, it it kind of messes with your libido. Yeah. Well, for, for sure it does that. And I will tell you, and I'm one of these like weird, you know, outlier non-responders or the opposite where the more melatonin I take, the more wired I get. Like it literally, I mean, I'm like insanely advanced <clears throat> to me, at least like brain wise. But like it makes me stay up more awake and it makes my brain like speed like pick up to almost to a point where like I don't want this. I'm not going to sleep. And that that is known in the literature that there are people that the higher the dose they take, the more 
it works like, uh, you know, in, in opposite way. So it's like, I'm, and I never could understand that because when I was a young kid and I was like, was reading about melatonin, you know, I would be taking 20 or 30 milligrams, which back then 25, 30 years ago was a high dose considered. And it would make me stay awake. And I was like, what in the hell is going on here? But he's different, you know? Yeah. I mean, yeah, we are. I had to quit yeah. meditating because I, I kept leaving my body and the seas warned yeah. me at one point, you know, that if you, if you keep doing this, you know, you might not come back. Right. And I right. said, well, okay, because, you know, I tend to go into the right. out of body state fairly quickly. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I guess. Hunter, we should probably do it. We should probably do at least a couple nights of like three grams and see what happens. Yeah, it's interesting with me. The lower the lower doses make me groggy, but the higher doses I actually sleep good when I've done the higher dose ones. So I don't know. It's um it's interesting. I don't use it all the time, but I'll I'll do it like periodically. But like lower dose, I I wake up groggy and then I, when I've done the higher dose, I wake up and I feel more refreshed. So well, I found I have to, I have to vary it because, you know, yeah. you take the same thing all the time, you know, your body just, just gets it's used to it. Up tolerance. Yeah. Yeah. So I try to change that. All right. So, so we'll pick up, I want to answer, I want you to, if you're okay with it, just for, you know, maybe five or 10 more minutes and then we'll pick up tomorrow. Um, and today's session has been incredible, but, um, what do the Cassiopeians say about AI? And by the way, before you answer, because you know, you and I have been talking about in emails about Elon, this whole truck thing is just exposing him at, a, at this point now. What? I mean, well, so first off, you know, it's the, the whatever his truck, whatever the, 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 the truck is for Tesla, whatever it's called, Hunter, I don't know what it is, but you know, there's a lot of people. Ugly thing that he made. Yeah, the retarded, yeah. But, but so, so now it's, it, it rusts. So there's massive lawsuits out there. Can you imagine buying a truck that rusts <laughs> in the rain, right? An all TV or an all terrain vehicle, like it's proposed to be where people can like be extremists and live in it and all this stuff. And now they're even selling like all sorts of like paraphernalia around how you can live in the remote wilderness and put a, put a tent or a TP or whatever on it. But then the other thing is the bulletproof thing, because Max sent an email today, you know, he advertises bulletproof. And so all these guys are out there getting it and testing it and it's not bulletproof. So, so the, obviously the question is, what does the C say about AI? Is there any positive element or aspect of AI? Well, I, I don't know if we've actually asked specifically about AIs. I, it seems like we have, I'd have to search the sessions, pull them up. But what, the one thing I remember is back in 1996 or 97, you know, uh, some questions were asked about alien invasion and so forth. And, uh, and the she said something about, you know, that computers would take over and control us. And then we were asking about, you know, the beasts of revelation, you know, 666. And they also said there that there was going to be a computer that could, you know, basically control everybody on earth, you know, and they were going to do it through a, uh, through a monetary control system. Jay disappeared. Oh. Uh, yeah. So, you know, controlling uh, travel and money and so forth. And uh, so basically, as far as AI is concerned, uh, I would I would suggest, but I'd have to search for it, that um, AI is... Uh, <coughs> It may it may try to take things over, but we already know to a certain extent how that will be because uh, way back in the old days when I worked for the welfare system in Florida, uh, they, we switched over to the computer computerized uh, dis distribution or dispersal, and that meant every case had to be had a, a data entry operator had to put everything, you know, fill in all these codes on these forms and put it in the computer. And when the day came to issue like food stamps, you know, the first day of the month, and there would be like lines outside the building, you know, all the way all down to the end of the building, around the corner and around the other side, across the parking lot, whatever. And then the computer went down. And it can't issue. And, and 
And I'm sure you had the experience of talking to a computer when you're trying to talk to your bank. Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> All the time. Press plus six, press five, if you this, you know. Blah, blah, blah. And, I mean, those are ways that computers already control us now. Just bump that up to where the computer right. is actually making the decisions at the top level instead of just being, you know, kind of like a program thing. But they're making the, and I mean, they can decide that human beings are irrelevant and need to be done away with and do it fairly quickly. So, you know, it's, uh, but interestingly, when I was writing today, I was writing a little bit about um, artificial intelligence and philosopher Philip Goff, Goff calls it functional intelligence as opposed to experiential intelligence, which is what comes with consciousness. Yeah. And he, uh, the, the idea was way back when, you know, Alan Turing was around was that he, um, he made what they call the Turing test. And if, if the, if the person is sitting there and he's got two people he's talking to behind a screen and he doesn't know, you know, one is human and one is a computer. Can he tell which is which? See, and if he can't, then the computer passes the test, right? And so people, you know, kind of objected to this a little bit. So he redefined intelligence to be functional intelligence, you know, if it can function, you know, systems and so forth. So intelligence has even been redefined and uh, how well human beings function as a system is highly questionable because what we were talking about earlier, you know, people make emotional decisions, not logical decisions. And how, how easy is it going to be for a computer to say, you know, that's not logical. You know, you're out. Boom. And I mean, you get a scene like in the matrix movie, you know, where the, where the, where the person is in the pod, you know, and they got all these things plugged into them, you know, keeping their illusions alive. And then the, the system figures out that they're they're doing something wrong and unplugs them and dumps them out the drain into the into the sewer. So uh, I don't think it's that simple. I don't think they're going to dump us into the sewer. I think they'll just euthanize us. And I mean, come on, we're already starting to do that. People people in control of governments are operating on functional intelligence, not right not experiential intelligence. I mean, look at Canada, you know. You have a problem, you call somebody for help, and they say, oh, would you like to be euthanized? You know? What kind of, what kind of, what kind of, that's, that's AI, in a sense. But it can get a lot worse. And then look, and look at the example of this Google AI system that can't produce a picture of a white person. You know, shows Vikings as black people. I mean, look at that. Quickly <laughs> absurd romance novel series that was put up on Netflix about all the lords and ladies and dukes and duchesses, whatever, in, in merry old England during the Regency period, played by Black. <laughs> I mean, that's not historically accurate. But <clears throat> truth is irrelevant. Right. Right. So... If you have a, an AI system to whom truth is irrelevant and they can be programmed that way, obviously, obviously they're not that smart. If, if that AI system that Google has was that stupid, then we got a problem. That's the interesting thing is I, I don't think it's actually that smart, even though there's very scary stuff around it. Jay and I have talked about this before. Do you think the AI is prepping for, call it, we'll just say fourth density. Maybe it's reptilian. Maybe it's, you know, some other fourth density being. Do you think it's a way because they're not able to hold form in third density? Do you think it's an extension arm of their invasion into this density to be able to control this density more and eventually squash humanity and squash, oh, yeah, that's you know, great. human consciousness? I like that idea. That's great. I think that uh, it's entirely possible because, I mean, when we were talking about the Lizzie's in the, in the 666 session, uh, they pretty clearly said that, let's see if you can get that out. Well, 
so 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 or, what's his name uh leo zagami says that it's all Jesuit predictive programming, but obviously we know that the lizards control all of the secret societies at this point, based on what you've you know declined or can, you know, figured out in the in the wave and what the seas have said. So it would stand to reason that all these people in this you know, under this mind control, call it of Jesuit predictive religious programming, that's what they're creating. That that's the reality that is being created, so that the Lizzies can eventually run the ship or run things from both third and fourth density. It's 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 creak. It's crazy to actually think about it because there's this guy. I know you're on Twitter. I need to start talking to you more on Twitter. But there's this guy called Donnie Darkened on Twitter. Donnie, who? Donnie Darkened. I'll send you his. I'll send you his Twitter address. But he has really profound. I will literally call it profound. I mean, it's almost like he's reading the future himself, you know, and I, I, I literally think he's like some sort of third density, unwitting stooge of them, but he's talking about what's happening in the geo, you know, geo didactic climate of politics and all the BS. And a lot of people are following this dude on Twitter now. And it's like, it seems like he is part of that Jesuit predictive programming. And it's like, if you follow it, right, you know, as a religious person and you think of the end times and the apocalypse and, you know, all these different things, what are they, the rapture and all this stuff, it's like you're manifesting that reality if you're in fear of that reality becoming true. Yeah. Well, as he said that the reason for all of the, the changes was because, uh, oh, what could they say here? So they're they're afraid of what's coming. Yeah, I can't see it exactly. And they said that uh, that things will get more chaotic as the, as the change intensifies. The changes intensify because they're afraid of losing control, and so it makes sense for them to. You know, utilize AI, computer systems, bank systems. Uh, you know, what really worries me is, is the use of, um, of like vaccines to implant things in people's bodies that make them more controllable. Right. Um, that that's that's kind of scary. And then there's also parasitical infections that can make you more controllable. I mean, if you've read anything about toxoplasmosis, I mean that stuff's creepy. That's not yeah. <clears throat> so. There's there's all kinds of ways that they're using to control us, and I don't think. Well, yeah, they talk about implanting things in your skin and like on your hand to, but I don't think we need to get as literal as that because they can e easily control everybody even without that. Well, I mean that goes back to like in 2020 and 2021 when they were doing the COVID test when they were jamming shit up people's noses. And they were scrapping around, screeching around. I mean, what the hell kind of nanite, nanotechnology, you know, plasmology stuff are they inserting into people's, you know, sinus uh, cavities? Well, I wouldn't necessarily think they're inserting anything, but that's not to say that some of them aren't. Right. Uh, but, right. you know, it's, it's, it's dangerous to be poking those long sticks up your nose. You could pop yeah. something. But, yeah. Yeah. It's uh, AI is <clears throat> is very problematical. It has a tool for gathering and collating information. Uh, I think it's unsurpassed. It's it's tremendous. I mean, yeah. Musk said something the the other day about using the, using uh, like his grok to uh, read through bills that brought up are brought up in Congress and and condense them down to what essentially is inside them so that people can be aware. I think that would be a tremendous use of it, you know, reading through all kinds of literature and uh, uh, assessing things, establishing chronologies and so forth would be tremendous. But the problem is, uh, I think if there is, the, the more we get mechanized, the more mechanical we become. Yeah. You know? So... I think that goes to the idea of the experiential intelligence. One thing Jay and I were actually talking about earlier this week is what I love so much about reading in books is that all three of us could read one book and we could all three have different insights. Wow. And when we come back to each other and share together, help me yeah. understand the book better and then help you understand the book better. And then we create 
a new knowledge set that took that one book and now like adds insight and uh, color to it to help us understand an interpretation of it better. But if you have people that are using an AI to do the reading for them, that's now doing that, they all get synced up into thinking one certain way, which is the way that the AI thinks things. So it's the, only the functional side and not the experiential side. Uh, but, you know, I also realized not everybody can read the way I read. You know, I have read a book a day almost every day for the last 60 years. Amazing. You know, so I don't know how many that is. If you have, it's a lot. Well, if you have, I don't know. <laughs> with. Be 1.8 million. Uh, it says, I think 21,900, almost 22,000. 22,000. So, you know, not everybody can do that. And they no. can't all remember that stuff. And then they can't, you know, put it together. So, you know, that's one of the reasons I wrote The Wave. The Wave was a product not only of the seas material, but a product of my experience and a product of this vast amount of reading I had done. And I would just, you know, pull things together. Like you said, on your on your crime board, you know. You got yeah. the, the, the central crime here in the middle, and then you've got all the things that connect to it and how they connect and and put it all together so that, you know, a person who, who reads the way can probably get the benefit of about at least 5,000 books. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, yeah. one, thing, one thing I wanted to ask you with your with your writing, because I you probably read, you know, several thousand books before you ever published your first book. To go back to where we were talking to earlier with the reality creation and then also becoming a fourth, you know, fourth density candidate. Do you think the creative process has changed the reality that you live within so much so that, like you were saying, that the reality that we really all three experience is so far removed from 95% of the world that it's like we don't experience the same things. Do you think there's something that connects the creative pursuit of writing? reading, producing material to uh, basically creating that section of reality that you carve out for yourself that we could argue, I guess, is maybe closer to becoming a fourth density candidate. It's like a conduit. <clears throat> you write about the conduits. That's yeah. essentially what you're It's a about. really good point because I've thought that myself. I have thought, you know, that all the work we've done, like all our networking, uh, people in our groups, uh, you know, things we we work on research and writing our living here. We have other groups that live to, uh, in, in network facilities, you know, in different places around the world and they experience different realities. And I think that it is part of the creation of a larger reality. And of course these, uh, these sessions are these meetings that I have with uh, group members around the world where, you know, we actively seek to explore, you know, these other realms and to uh, try to have an effect, a beneficial effect on the planet and on ourselves and each other. That's, that's also part of it. And uh, all of it hopefully will coalesce at the point in time that things are necessary. You know, we are sending out a signal by doing that. We are also increasing our receivership capabilities. And those are the important things. What does he say? It's not who you are, it's or it's not where you are, it's who you are and what you see. And That's seeing right. means seeing the unseen. I mean, it's seeing in the sense that Paul, uh, the Apostle Paul, understood seeing, that you see the uh, the reality of the, in, the eternal verities, not the reality of today and, and the whole thing that was supposed to be depicted by the crucifixion which was it was supposed to be an example of a man who saw a higher reality and was faithful unto death because he believed in what he saw more than what was around him you know the, the lies and deceptions and he went to his death because he saw this higher reality that was the example that was supposed to be being set by that. So it, that's what it means when the seeds say, you know, it's not where you are, it's who you are and what you see. Do you see the eternal reality 
do you, you know, do you experience it? And we experience it constantly. I mean, it, it's part of our lives. Yeah. So. Laura, I'm going to let you go. And this has been so profound. We'll pick up literally tomorrow. Um, I've got a bunch of questions in my mind right now that just literally lifted off of them today. But um, thank you so much again, as always. You're welcome. And thank you for talking to me. It's, it gives me something to look forward to. <laughs> <laughs>